How many of you here are regular meditators? Wow, impressive. How many of you have meditated before, have some experience? <laughs> My goodness. And how many of you are meditating for the first time today? Very welcome to all of you. So I think you're here to meet Sanim and to meditate. So I will not take up too much time with the introduction, but I will introduce um, Sanim right away by asking the first question. You said that it's a very special day for you today. Mm, yeah. Well, every day is a good day in Zen. So every day is really, 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 really special, really every moment. But today is interesting the timing of this talk because exactly 30 years ago today i became a monk so it's the today's my 30th anniversary party congratulations secretly in china yeah. i hope you're enjoying celebrating your 30th with Absolutely, us here sure. yeah. um I know Sanim personally, so I'll make, you've already read his bio on the Asia Society website, I'm sure. So I'll just make this introduction a little bit personal. Mm. You were born Paul Munson right. into a Catholic family. You went to Yale as undergraduate mm -hmm. and Harvard Divinity School. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, this guy from New Jersey becomes a Buddhist monk <sighs> in 1992, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And you followed your teacher, whom you had met mm. a few years prior to becoming a monk, mm -mm. to a temple in Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm. So what makes a guy from New Jersey follow a Korean Buddhist monk yeah, yeah, yeah. all the way to a country that you had yeah, never yeah. been to before? Totally, totally. And eating white rice for breakfast every day, too. Yeah, I'm, it's very simple, suffering. Suffering. Suffering is what brought me to this practice. Suffering is what brought me to the teacher. Suffering is what brought me to this life. The question of suffering, you know, why do we suffer? Why am I born in this world? Why must I die? You know, I was, as even as a little kid, even though I did normal kind of kid kind of things, I always had that in the back of my head. Like, what is this? Kind of like a Truman Show feeling. Is this, are we just on TV somehow? You know, in Chuanzu, that butterfly. Am I dreaming of a butterfly or am I in the dream of a butterfly? I mean, I had that kind of thing, you know, of like, what is reality? What is truth? What is, you know, what is real? You know, what is the matrix? So I basically had that question as a, you know, as a young guy growing up and did lots of, you know, partying and experiencing and traveling and everything, learning, but inside it just didn't satisfy me, you know, and, it, and then you get, of course, from Jesus teachings, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within, the kingdom of heaven is within, the kingdom of heaven is within. So I was like, okay, so how do I go there? You know, do I have to wait till I die? No. And so when I met sort of Asian teachings from Asia and certainly meditation teachings, I was like, oh, there's a technology, there's a way there's a way in, there's a way in. And then when I started doing it a few times, I was like, this stuff works. Like, like this really works. So I was like, okay, you know, how do I buy the car? I like the ride, how do I buy the car? And I basically, I met this great, I was very lucky to meet this great master from South Korea, actually originally from North Korea. And um, he just, boom, blew my mind. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. What were you doing when you first met your teacher? And what exactly transpired in that meeting? Uh, yeah, I, I had a chance to meet him. I, I was a grad student. I had like long hair and leather jacket. I was studying all this like existential philosophy at Harvard and thought I knew like how I could put the synthesis together of Eastern thought and Western thought and Schopenhauer and what his idea of the total man is and put that together with some updated because he was really bad about women and put all this out and Jesus' teachings and the Buddhist teachings. I had this whole synthetic idea and I went, I had this opportunity to meet this great monk who I had been practicing some of his teachings, finally got a chance to meet him, bowed down or kind of like knee to knee, yay across like one meter space. And I'm like going on with this thing. I want to do this and the hybrid of East and West and put it all together with this and Schopenhauer, what he said about Jesus. And suddenly I just heard, who are you? And I was like, holy shit. 
And I look up and he's just, he's like this distance. He's like, who are you? I'm like looking at a finger. And I said, up, 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 Paul. And he said, that's your body's name. Your mama gave you that name. I don't want your body's name. Before that, you had no name. Who is that? And I went, I really, I was like, I hit a told my whole conceptual, just everything just bam, hit a brick wall. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And he said, study that. I said, no more books, no more books. You don't need books. Study that. You don't know you. Look into that. And something inside me knew he was pointing to the truth. And it doesn't matter how many books I read. And I met and the people I saw in school who read more and more and more books were more and more and more miserable. So it's not that way. So I was like, how do I find it? So he just kind of, I, I came right up against what I didn't know. And we don't know. You don't know, 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 you don't know. God doesn't know, Buddha doesn't know. Jesus also doesn't know. You don't know. But this don't know is pregnant. Don't know. Just looking into don't know. So looking into that, that's the beginning of truth, reality. Because then you shut up. And yet after that meeting, you still went to graduate school and finished yeah. your studies. Yeah. Uh, but then you decided to become a monk. Yeah. 1992, yeah. 30 years ago. Mm. And you were the first Westerner to be ordained monk as a monk in China at that right. time. Yeah. How did you become ordained in China and not in Korea? Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of interesting story. It would take a little long, but it was illegal. If the, com I, if the Communist Party found out that I was ordained, my teacher and I would have been banned forever. We went into the country and we said, you know, we're just going on a pilgrimage. We're just going on a pilgrimage. He brought a bunch of people from Hong Kong. And we had to sign a statement to the Communist Party of China, People's Republic of China. We hereby promise that we will not engage in any religious or missionizing activities. We are only here as tourists. I like took the Zimmer, I was like, we signed this, right? I'm thinking like, you know, you don't make lies. Yeah, you just signed it, <laughs> boom, gave him papers. And a week later, we're in China. He goes, oh, your ordination ceremony will happen here. I'm like, sir, we signed a piece of paper. He goes, yeah, that's a, a, that's a communist style. We are Buddha style. Buddha means freedom. No problem. So I said, okay. So I had the ceremony, um, the kind of secret ceremony, but it happened there. And uh, that was it. And his whole thing was, yeah, I could become a monk in Korea very easily, but he wanted to kind of stick it. To, he, was trying to bring, he was trying to bring Zen back to China, really. So he's trying to stick it to the rules and be, you know, and he thought the Chinese monks would be really impressed seeing all these Western monks practicing basically something that they engineered for many, many years. So his, his whole thing, he was a very kind of, you know, he's a kind of shifty guy for bodhisattvic purposes. So that's how it happened. Well, I feel like we should delete this illegal secret ceremony Just apart from the, the recording. Don't worry. Yes. I'm banned in China already. <laughs> okay. I am. I am banned in China. So it's no problem. Okay, so your life as a monk starts in Korea with your um, teacher at Hwagesa. Yeah. And you receive in 2001 your uh, INGA, what's sort of the um, authorization? INGA, yeah. Uh, as an enlightened monk, by your <laughs> teacher. Mistake. Yes. Yes. And yeah. what is that like to go through the uh, ceremony of that? How do you pass the test? Uh, well, it's years and years and doing koan study and you get beat up in the koan study, the dokusan, you know, you have these expressions and you go on to higher and higher levels and you train and train. It's not like something you aspire to. It's just something that in the community life, if you're noticed to have some sort of practice and the other teachers, you know, make it clear that you have some sort of an insight, then you get tested more and tested more and tested more. And so I did, then he told me once I did this big retreat, I wrote about it on my blog recently about this experience, but I went off, I did this intense retreat, came back, we had, he smacked me around in the Dokusan room, you know, really like really hardcore interview. And then he said, okay, you're ready. So you're going to have the ceremony. So we had a 90 day retreat and then you sit on a cushion right here 
and all of these monks and nuns who've been doing retreat for 90 days with no news or no anything, looking into their minds in science, then one by one, you sit there and one by one, they come up, they bow to you and they can toss a question at you. And you must, you with as few words as possible, as few, like literally not even a sentence each answer, you're based on what appears, your wisdom, if it's wisdom. Uh, meanwhile, the teacher, the Zen master is over there and he did this kind of like a hangman's thing, but not, it's like we did in the West where you have this person hanging, but it's some, it's like Zhong, the Zhongjia, you know, you know that. So they do like the five strokes of a Chinese card. Well, his thing was three. If you got three mistakes, if you made three wisdom mistakes, you're out. So I passed it and he was really happy. And then he says, okay, you got it. Um, some of you may be familiar with koan practice or um, may know that this kind of Zen questions are not your typical intellectual questions where you ask an intellectual question and receive an intellectual answer. So maybe you can explain a little bit later on. But so you're at this temple and yeah. you help your teacher publish um, books of his teachings. Yeah. You yourself published a book. Uh, which became a bestseller in Korea because I also read it when I lived there. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say uh, you were very well known, sort of like celebrity status. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> and then after your teacher passed away yes. and, and staying a few more years in Korea, about 12 years ago, you moved to Regensburg. Yeah. And from a very big temple with... Uh, hundreds of years of history, you are now teaching in a small Zen center yes. in Regensburg in yes. Germany. Yes. Yeah. And our Zen center, but this is the really cool stuff. We're right in the Altstadt of Regensburg, but our, the Zen center we founded, we are located directly over the spot where the emperor Marcus Aurelius wrote sections of his book, the meditations. I get, I, I get, I get like, what do we, we say? Ganze Haut. I get Ganze Haut goosebumps whenever I, whenever I walk in the room. I literally over this place, Marcus Aurelius, because he was up there kicking some German butt for about five years. And he was, his base was right where our Zen center is now. And then there was a Pope across the street, Benedict. So it's a kind of a, a vortex spot. Um, of some sort of spiritual something uh, there. So we have a little meditation center, yeah, where we have a quieter life than in Korea. And I know that your teacher, Sing San Sunim, was well known for teaching Buddhist um, message to the Western students. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel that you're sort of following in his footsteps by opening up the Zen Center in Regensburg, Germany as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about more about Buddhism now. Mm. What exactly is Zen Buddhism and how is it different from other schools of Buddhism? Okay, so Zen Buddhism is um, just direct experience of your true nature. It just means waking up. It means waking up, not by stages, not by texts, not by course or curricula or years or degrees. It's direct experience of your true nature. Just direct experience of your true nature. And that can't be gotten through books and understanding and conceptual knowledge. That's why it emphasizes meditation. So the word Zen, it's just a kind of fancy word that just means meditation. Zen only means meditation. So whenever you say Zen meditation, you're saying meditation, meditation. It's kind of interesting. That's an interesting way to remember it. So you're saying meditation, meditation. We're the meditation guys and girls. It's direct meditation, not so much books. That's why my teacher... He didn't want us doing books. You know, he didn't want us studying books, even his own. You know, when I wrote a book for him, you know, and published it, he four years of work on this book and writing it and getting everything right and getting it published by a really great publisher, Shambhala, and everything, get the whole thing get together. It arrives in the United States. I get the UPS guy, take it out of the truck, fly over to Korea, wrapped in silk, go and I offer it to him. Sir, the book is ready that I have worked four years on. Your complete teaching, it is ready. I just went... He just like flipped through it. And then he went, throw this in the garbage. I was like, sir, what, was there some sort of mistake here? He goes, he said, many people will read these words. This is his own book. 
attach to the words and concepts and lose their true way. Better we kill it now. <laughs> I was like, wow, he, that, and that's it. So that's then. So this bottle, like this bottle says, Lokalis Wasser seit 1559, Erfrischendes Trinkwasser ohne Kaulensäure aus der historischen Weiterleitung in Zentrum von Zurich, abgefüllt, blah, blah, blah. So that's an understanding that tells someone what's in that bottle. That's our understanding of what's in that bottle. But Zen means So the words and speech don't give us what the true nature of that is. They're partially helpful, kind of sometimes need them, but they're not the real thing. They're just a description. So that's why I say it's like a form finger pointing at the moon. So Zen really emphasizes that to a radical degree, to a radical, to an almost excessive degree. So that's why you have stories of Zen monks burning the sutras, you know, because you can see these monks just kind of with their heads in them all the time, kind of quoting them. And that's the problem with any religion, you know, any kind of thing that's got a book that people get too deeply attached to, we start to have problems. So Zen guys don't make those problems. We just like shut up and sit down and look into our nature. And then when you really look, when you really make that, it's not hard. Something becomes clear. It's already clear. It's already clear. But you're just not aware of it. So Zen is just that little effort you make to allow awareness of it to be manifest. So Zen is like that. Thank you for that example of drinking from the glass that was very nice yeah. um so what what is buddhism saying about waking up what are you trying to wake up from and you mentioned suffering is a very important concept um in buddhism can you explain a little bit more about that yeah because we're thinking and we don't even realize we're thinking we're, human beings are living in a dream created entirely by memories and plans and ideas and education and bias and hurt and trauma and this and desire and this and just going around and around and around like someone's sitting in a movie theater and you really believe that the movie is real. And then someone else, your partner or your coers is having their little movie theater experience of trauma and desire and history, whatever their victimhood is or their sister. And they've got their little thing and they can't connect because everyone believes that their dream is the truth. So that's also meditation just means waking up from that doesn't mean you leave it behind I still have my memories I still have my plans I still have my desires a lot less of them now but a few of them are still remaining hanging around I have my you know plans I have my, my aspirations but they don't operate on me they don't operate on me they're just there for when I need it then intuitively you pick it up, you can do it. But instead of it swirling around all the time and believing to yourself that that is real. real. So when we're sitting in meditation, I often say people treat your thinking just like sounds. Your thinking has the same substance, good thinking, bad thinking, pink thinking, democratic thinking, Russian thinking, Swiss thinking, male thinking, gay thinking, political thinking, economic. Your thinking just is like sound. It's just, it has the same substance as sound, but we enter into our thoughts. When a dog barks outside, we don't enter into that sound in our head. It just bark, bark. But in our thinking, we hold it. So if I say something horrible to you, maybe three hours later, maybe three days, maybe three weeks, maybe whole life cannot connect with me. But it's just thinking, it's just a sound. Ah, where's that sound right now? What place in the universe does it exist? But I hate you. I never loved you. No, yeah, whatever we do every day, or we do it like this too. Same as that sound, like what I just did. Like where is that? But you hold it, then you suffer. So when they want to catch, like in the old days in Indonesia, like. Monkey brains was a kind of a Viagra, but it was a health food, whatever. So they would have to eat the monkey brain when the monkey was still alive. So that when you catch a monkey, you take a take a coconut and you cut off, cut just a little top, little top part of the coconut, and you put papaya and mango and and you know, the, you know banana pieces in because a monkey is just basically a dog that can climb trees in a sense. So you just put that on the ground with a chain connected to the tree, 
cover it with leaves. And then the monkey comes in, puts a hand in. Then, can't get out, suffering. All of us look and go, oh, stupid monkey, just go like that. Then you're free. Same like all of us. So just this holding onto this something that's an illusion that has no reality, letting go of that is freedom. That's it. So you have to make some effort. It doesn't come from a book. Someone can't teach you that. You're a Buddha or a monk. So you have to go down and actually just like really, really experience it. Then that is just useful 24 seven till the end of your life. Amazing. And why do you think meditation is especially important today? Because we have so many more interesting ways of falling asleep that we've made. We've made many, many, many interesting ways of staying asleep. So uh, I have a friend who's a, a psychotherapist and said during the pandemic, like so many of the, the people coming in, they were, it was a totally different way of suffering that they were bringing to her. Some other therapist said a similar thing to me. That was a totally different kind of suffering that people were bringing as they were trapped at home. They couldn't interact, whatever the stress of it and everything. They couldn't, you know, so just watching Netflix and binging on bad food or whatever. But it was just this whole different dislocation from reality started appearing in the therapy room all the time. So we've made up, you know, we've made up all these ways where we stay asleep. Um, someone asked me recently, what, what's a kind of new kind of suffering that we have nowadays that you never saw before? I'm like, you go around the city, you see these like these little scooters that everyone has, these little like motorized scooter things, you put a credit card in or something, you go and like, how many times have each of one of us gone to a store and there's like a scooter that was just like left there? So whenever human beings get a new and easy convenience, we often turn it into an object of suffering for ourselves or for whatever. What about in 20 years? What are we going to do with all these scooters, right? When we learn to fly or something. So nowadays, human beings, we've just gotten really, really, really good. We've gotten at, at distraction, let's say. That's a form of suffering. And then and removal from our connection to nature, then we've lost our teacher. We've lost our mother. So meditation is... Actually, you, if you live out in nature, you don't really need to meditate. <laughs> That's the Zen master. That's Buddha. That's no I. People hear that Zen or Buddhism emphasizes that there's no I, and they get freaked out by it. No I? How's that possible? I would say, go out into nature. When you're standing in front of the mountains, where's the I? Why we all find it refreshing is that we're there, and it's like, finally, oh, oh. Something, it's not I, this complicated, narrow, neurotic thing. So anyway, Zen meditation is, or any kind of meditation, Christian meditation, there's lots of forms of meditation. Zen is just one kind of cake. There's lots of cakes out there. But Zen is a very direct one for just waking up right now. Mm. You just mentioned that some people get freaked out, but mm. uh, I also get a lot of questions from people who are interested in meditation, but they're afraid that, doing uh, spiritual practices like meditation will turn them into recluses and make them withdraw from the world. Um, is, yeah. that some, is that a legitimate concern? Well, I wish that that would be then applied to me because I would really like to be a recluse. I've been doing 30 years of meditation and I can't find the recluse life anywhere. In the advertising literature that I signed up for, I thought I would be alone, quiet in the mountains, but I'm kind of pretty active out in the world. And a lot of my monk brothers and sisters are too. Um, so, so no, it, it doesn't mean a removal. It, I always say, you know, the great way to look at it is like, you look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is a great meditator, great meditator. Cause he's really helping people. He's like healing and giving them food and making sure they're taken care of and helping them with stuff. And then bam, he just disappears. He's like out in the middle of the dead sea and you know, on a boat alone, or he's gone to the mountains or he goes to the desert but then he comes back. Then he comes back. He doesn't just keep this peace and tranquility for himself. And that's sort of the difference, you know? So you don't, I mean, I wish I could become a recluse. I would like many times to have that fantasy life of, you know, being a monk up in the kind of the wispy kind of ravines and just kind of eating one spoonful of rice every day and just in my somatic bliss. But 
I, I probably go out of my mind with that because I want to help people. I mean, you, 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 you just feel the suffering of the world calling you. It's, it's, it's screaming for it. And so I, that bliss would be very short lived to enjoy on my own. And I know that. So I'd like to be a recluse, but until suffering stops, I'm not going to get that chance. It looks like. Well, um, since you said that Zen is not really about talking or intellectualizing, but actually having the direct experience, we'll try now to get a little taste of that direct experience. Um, but first, maybe you can describe to our audience how you would like them to sit. I already see that many of our participants are already very comfortable on their mats, very experienced sitting in um, meditation pose. So I think you wanted to do 15 minutes of sitting. Yeah. Um, could you tell them how they should sit, how yeah. they should breathe, what they okay. should be doing during the meditation? Sure. Okay. So we'll just do some basic download and you can use this for anything. You know, if you do Christian prayer, if you do yoga, this is universal, basic A, B, C, D, E, F, G primer to meditation. And then you get the little Zen emphasis at some point of it. So I have to take these off. If you're in a chair, chair is great. Uh, I know many people who sit in a chair. Um, the first thing is, um, if you're sitting on the ground, really important is um, you have a cushion that provides a little bit of support. And you don't sit on the cushion like a chair. This is not a chair. It's not a stool. You use this as a, auf Deutsch, ein Keil, a Keil, a, a wedge. This cushion should only function as a wedge. Of course, everyone has different body and different body conditions. So you can ride it like a little horsey if you want, many different things. There's no one correct way. But basically, it's like this. What you're making, see, they want to make some sort of nice film here, it looks like, and they want to have it not shaky or anything. So they make a tripod, make a tripod. It's a very stable form. So that's what the sitting posture is. Doom, doom. This is a tripod. And a tripod makes a nice long exposure photograph. Um, again, if you sit with some variation, all of this applies. I always put the right leg down first, right leg down first on the floor, and then the left leg in front of it. Depends what your skill level is. If you do some yoga, you can bring this baby up a little bit. It's up to you. There's no one way to do it. Basically, you're making a tripod, and that tripod should be one that you can handle. Don't do something because you saw a picture of it on some Buddhist store or something. Then very important with meditation is everyone, everyone touch your belly button, put your finger in your belly button. And then if you take about two, that's your belly button, okay? If you take about three fingers underneath your belly button, put your finger in there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's the sweet spot in tennis or in golf, baseball too, you know, you want to hit, you want to hit the ball with the tennis racket with what's called the sweet spot, the part of the most power, you can hit it with other parts of the racket, but that sweet spot has the greatest power and control. So that's our sweet spot. That is literally our mind body sweet spot. It's called the hara in Japanese, the hara or the tanjan, tanjan in Sino-Korean. So what we do is we bring our fingers together in front of that, in front of that. It's really cool. This is a really, really, really cool tool. If you, if you know, everyone has a different kind of orientation. So if it's, if your hara is up here, don't hold your hands up here. Just, it's a kind of general kind of in the neighborhood of kind of relationship we're talking about here. So you put your fingers here, take your right hand, put your left hand inside it and you touch the tips of your thumbs together. This is a really important tool. This, until today, I benefit from the use of this because this is just an awareness tool. It's called the mudra, mudra. Mudra has no, it doesn't, there's no secret or special meaning. It just means hand gesture, it means a teaching. So you've seen this, when you see a Buddha statue that's got this, he's teaching. There's a teaching, he's like, he's teaching. It's, it means he's doing this. This is, if, if you go to Italy, if you go to Italy, this is an Italian mudra. <laughs> the Italian mudra, hey, what, what, when you see that, you see the shoulders up a little bit like that. That's an Italian mudra. So this is a meditation mudra, hand position. And it's really beautiful, this, because why we have mudra is because 
our fingers follow our thinking and our think, oh, did I say that last? Oh my God, did I really drink that much? I took off my shirt. Oh my God, I can't believe it. When you have a lot of thinking, your fingers are here. When you have a lot of emotion, oh, I loved you, you never listened. When you have emotion, your fingers kind of go around here. And this is our will. This is our will. So this is kind of our intellectual center, our emotional center, and our will. So this mudra is such an extraordinary part of the meditation experience. You don't focus on it. I just want to disabuse you of any ideas. There's no focusing in meditation. Meditation is not about focusing. Meditation is not about concentrating. We don't do that stuff. You don't do concentration. You don't do focus in meditation. If anyone tells you to do that, okay, make your own judgments, but uh, I'm telling you, it's not going to be helpful. Take, take your fist. Everyone make a fist really strongly. Really strong. Come on, the Swiss are strong. You guys don't show it too much, but I know it's in there somewhere. Come on. How long can you do that? 20 seconds. And it hurts here too, right? Okay. So that's concentration. Literally, that is. I'm concentrating energy in this point. This is focus. I'm focusing my arm mental mm, mm, to this point. That's focusing. That's concentrating. And any kind of focusing or concentration can't be done for long periods. If I tell you to stare at a dot on the floor or whatever, think about a white elephant or something, you get a headache. So we don't concentrate in meditation. We do not focus. You can't do it for long. So with your mudra here, What's really cool about the mudra is your, your, your brain is like, hey, what's going on down there where the fingers are? They're usually doing interesting things every day. So your, your brain, it, it, it's such a great hack that's in the truth because your subtle mental energies are just kind of in an unconscious way coming to your center point. That's why we do this. The fingertips, these sensitive, you go to the acupuncturist, these points that can have control over your liver and your stomach and your lungs and your brain and your whatever. Those sensitivities are right at your will, right in front of your hara, okay? So you sit in that basic posture. Um, uh, it should be rounded, not lazy like this or kind of lazy like this. It's just this kind of, I come back to it all the time. It's kind of like when you drive in a car, when you drive in a car, you're always making like micro adjustments, but your car is going, when I was a kid and I saw my father driving, I'd be like, the car's going straight, but he keeps turning the steering wheel. Isn't that a little bit dangerous? But then when I got up and I started to learn how to drive a car, I saw what it's about. You make these micro adjustments. So this mudra, it's just this center of subtle awareness. Don't think about it, leave it alone, but it helps you to develop awareness basic awareness of the natural movement of breath in your center, in your heart. So take your hands together like that in the mudra. Eyes are half open. In Zen meditation, eyes are half open. Now, some traditions have you do the eyes closed, and that's okay. If you like that, do it. But if you keep your eyes open, something really interesting happens. Not special interesting. You stay awake actually more when your eyes are open. You stay awake. That's the thing. And, and Zen means wake up. So, um, so you have your eyes about half open. You're not focusing. You know, part of the meditation experience, and, and, and all of us will kind of have it tonight a little bit, we're all so highly adapted to this kind of relationship and this kind of over-focusing and especially synaptic overload from the lives we lead in modern society with cities and options and stuff and games and Netflix and all this stuff so that we can be a little bit kind of like over, kind of like jolted, stimulated. So when you first sit down in meditation, don't expect everything to be like, you know, butterflies and peace and quiet in the very beginning. In fact, that's where you start to become a little aware of the noise, the background noise that drives your life into corners. So just in that posture, basic, eyes half open. Some people say, oh, when the eyes are open, it's hard. It's not hard. Your ears are open, okay? If your ears are open, why doesn't that, your nose is open. I have these discussions with people all the time. I got to walk them back from the fact that having your eyes open is not a distraction because your ears are open, right? Yes. 
And your nose is open, right? Yes. And you have a sensation in some part of your body, right? Yes. Good. Keep your eyes open. Eyes means rooted in this moment. That's how you know if you're awake or asleep, when your eyes are open. And it's also a great teacher because a lot of times we're looking at the floor, seeing just as we hear. We're seeing the floor, even myself. This is such a great teacher. I sit retreats all the time. And I'll, I'll be sitting, I'll be like, okay, I'm giving you guys some kind of very secret information about my personal spiritual practice. But I have a busy job in running a community and I have lots of stuff to do. So sometimes I'm sitting there and I'll be like, deep in it. And I'll be like, there's like a voice to myself. I'm like, hey, dude, you didn't, met, you, you didn't notice the floor for like the last 20 seconds, man. Dude, you're really thinking about something. I get that. I get that. And I only know that because my eyes are open. But if my eyes were closed and I'm in pixel, mixel land of images and sensations, you don't know the difference between awake or asleep. So it's a great, it's a feedback. It's a feedback. Same with hearing. Oh, I didn't notice those birds. Oh, that bell has been ringing outside that I love so much. Oh, I didn't notice that. So then you just come back. So that's the point. When you're in this situation, don't hold the breath. Don't force it. Don't make some unnatural breathing movement. Rather, your natural breath movement. Your natural breath. And then you just reflect off of it. You just notice the breath rising and falling. Just noticing it. Just like you notice sounds. And then what sees that? What hears that? What sits here? Not as a conceptual, you know, college philosophy course conundrum, but really like in, in what sees this? Some sensation in my leg. What feels that? One of my biggest, most profoundest opening, the first opening I kind of had we can maybe say, was from a leg injury, from a football injury. And I was sitting in meditation, I, what, uh, extreme pain. And I didn't, you can't avoid it. So I just went, okay, what is pain? What is pain? What is this thing, pain? When you look into pain, it ain't there. There's nothing there. And then, I, so I had that experience. I actually looked and saw that there's no pain isn't a thingness. It doesn't have a thing. There's a, you know, Right now, it's pretty elementary stuff, but for a college kid, that was a big deal. And then I went, well, then what is this I that is really upset about the pain? Like when you and re, 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 reflect back, then I saw there was nothing there, nothing in the control tower, nothing there, but not nothing, no thing. It means, it means everything, speech. So use everything in your experience um, uh, as part of your practice. If thoughts come, as Suzuki Roshi says, leave the front door and the back door open. Let thinking come and go with no hindrance. Only don't serve it tea. They got a couple of bottles of wine over there because they want a couple of people to stay for a little while. So you serve them wine, they want to stay. So when your thinking comes, just don't serve it tea. Then it will just pop up. Then reflecting like what sees my fault. Okay, so um, those are the basics for doing it. Um, you might have to modify the sitting time uh, if I've gobbled up a lot of time. Well, why don't we try 15 minutes? Try 15, okay. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, so if we're going to do that, then everyone, because some of you folks sitting on the floor can like stretch out your legs or... Am I the only one who's experiencing leg problems right now? Just loosen it up a little bit, get the blood down in there. You know, this is not, meditation is not, it's not supposed to be a suffering exercise. It's not a suffering procedure, like going to the dentist. Then meditation just means, meditation just means being. It just means everyone has a cat, you know? People who have a cat, they say that cat is my Zen master. Well, that's the thing. Zen meditation means just returning to that mind that the cat has, that the dog has. Very clear, very pure, very present in this moment. But we're hyper-stimulated, so we need these sorts of 
trainings sometimes to get a little bit clearer. And for the participants who are sitting in chairs, should they do the same hand? Um, of course, yes. Thank you for that. Breathing. Yeah, for sure. That so definitely they're helps. Sitting in the chair. And you know, I mean, don't uh, we have this tendency from looking at devices all the time? We have this kind of like this. Everyone has a slouch now. It's called tech neck. My therapist friends, you know, it's, it's a real term by the, the physiotherapist. They call it tech neck. We've got this kind of like tech neck. So just a little bit of, you know, this helps the breathing uh, apparatus, gives some architecture to the act of presence. I'll give little prompts. This isn't traditional hardcore Zen style, what I do anymore um, with teaching. So I'll give little prompts, little nudges in the sitting, and they're just meant to bring you back to your job, which is moment. Okay. So find your posture, find something that works for you. Just one thing for people sitting on the ground and cushions, Zen does not, meditation does not mean crossing your legs. We need to come up with a different word for it. We say cross-legged. If you cross your legs like that, you cut off circulation and you get paralysis. So if you do sit down, just put the legs flat on the ground. And then if that works, you can bring this, this one up like this. That's up to you, but just any compression will make it uncomfortable after a while. Just comfortable, easy sitting. 